you know, what do we actually wish? What do we actually want people to be able to, with information, so they can, right? right? What do we want people to be able to accomplish because of information and the skills that we want them to develop? So I'll just give you a minute to think and to write a sentence for yourself. Those of you who are tweeting, I take it on Twitter, too. Anyone willing to share their sentence? Thank you. I wish patients were aware of information so they can access information in order to use information. Okay. So eventually we want to uh, drive ourselves towards use, right? So the access is not the end in of itself, but it's for the purpose of use. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Great, oh, you can arm wrestle for it. <laughs> Okay, I really love that, be able to connect with people and with the ultimate goal of a richer life. Very nice. Go ahead. Um, uh, be able to engage with information so they can analyze and evaluate that information in order to effectively use it in different contexts. Okay, adding in that importance of context, that's fantastic. Love it. Great. Be able to enhance their life with information so they can succeed in order to be happy. In order to be happy. <coughs> now I have to say that these kinds of statements to me are far more inspiring and motivating for my own personal practice than the ACRL definition and standards. As much as I will absolutely pledge allegiance to those standards, but I think it's very important for us to have a sense of why it is that we want to have this work going on. And I'm just going to put up, I actually um, <coughs> borrowed this exercise with, from Diane Schmore, um, who was at Hong Kong Baptist University. Now, I think she had a little bit more time to wordsmith hers than I gave you today. Um, hers says, regular, wise use of best suited information to build, change, and or challenge knowledge in order to support decision making, problem solving, and growth. So. Um, you know, she's got a lot compacted in there. And then she has this little like explanatory phrase as well. It's not just an ability or a skill, but it's a practice and a mindset. But when I saw this particular way of approaching, sort of thinking about what this meant, you know, I think it's important that we know our professional standards and the like, but why we're doing it really got back to all of you to a very deeply personal reason that we're doing this. So this is a very typical ALA definition. It's really the seminal definition in our profession from the 1989 ALA Presidential Commission on Information Literacy. Um, a person must be able to recognize when information is needed and have the ability to locate, evaluate, and use effectively the needed information. Now one of the things that I think is very important that we again take and stop for a moment and see this does not say what libraries should do. Okay? Information literacy or information literateness is not the characteristic of the institutions that we work in. It is a characteristic of the people that we work for in the sense of the people that we serve, the people whose lives you all just express so beautifully, we're trying to impact. And we have that goal. Um, in fact, <laughs> Libraries may 
may not even be necessary to achieving this state, though I would argue that what we do is likely quite important and useful. But I think it's important that we not think of ourselves as the gateway or the, the, tr the gate through which people must pass in order to be information literate, but instead think of ourselves <coughs> as a resource that may catalyze and make people be able to attain this characteristic more efficient and effectively. Okay? But we want to be really careful that we don't think of ourselves as holding information literateness that we pass out to those who are, you know, come to us. Okay? And I think it's great that this definition left libraries out in the sense of really crystallizing that we need to focus on the people. Now, another very important piece, I think, especially for those of us who work in academia, is this 1996 EDUCOM review article called Information Literacy as a Liberal Art in which they posit that information literacy should really be treated as sort of equivalent to the trivium of the basic liberal arts, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Okay? So putting this in, it, to be educated means to be information literate. And if you aren't information literate, we wouldn't consider you educated. Now, this is a particular conception of educated, and it's different than whether you were schooled. Okay, um, and there are already today people have raised in really great ways some of the problems with some of these definitions and I promise you I'm getting to that too. The other thing that I want us to make sure that we're aware of is that while that ALA definition is, is, a, is a normative definition, it's a definition that experts, i.e. the library community who decided we were the experts on this, we could question how that happened too and whether we're comfortable with that and if we were as inclusive as we should have been and all those sorts of things. But nonetheless, that ALA definition is an expert definition and it's a normative. It says this is what information literacy is and people either are closer or further away from that. Okay? Well, Christine Bruce in Australia, as well as a number of other researchers, have taken a different approach and said, you know what? Let's not ask what experts believe information literacy is, but let's ask people <coughs> what it means to them. Now, I want to be clear, they didn't say, what does information literacy mean to you? <laughs> they were smart researchers, and they said, what does it mean to you to be successful with information? Okay, And tell me a time when you were successful with information. So obviously, even in that research question, was it embedded in that notion that information was for use? Okay, so we can question that too, because hey, we're in academia, that's what we do. But <laughs> here is the results of her work, resulting in, a, at this point now, a, a, it was a quite famous article at its time, and it's actually her dissertation research. Um, now it's less well known, but the seven faces of information literacy where she analyzed these transcripts of these very, very intensive interviews, two to four hours with each person over multiple times, using a methodological approach called phenomenography. I can never, I have to think about that word in order to say it. But the, usually we think about research as trying to find a single definition, like we come to consensus on something. And this particular research approach actually seeks out the diversity <coughs> of perspectives. So it's interesting, even in that. And this is the diversity of perspectives that she found in the stories that people told. Sometimes being successful was about wrangling information technology. <clears throat> Sometimes it was about sources, search process. Sometimes it was about managing information. Other times it was about coming to know something new, something additional. And then my favorite, sometimes it was about making a wise decision. Okay. Now obviously as we look at this, we can think about as librarians where we've focused our professional practice. We've focused in a normative way and we've very much focused on probably conceptions two, three, and a little bit of four. Okay. Um, just as a side note, um, since this research, Christine Bruce has written a book which was published by ALA Editions called Informed Learning, where she lays out 
that if you <coughs> believe this diversity of perspectives, you'll approach your curriculum by seeking to give students as many different kinds of information experiences as possible, as opposed to sort of our gold standard single approach. Something to explore and think about. <coughs> Now, I've laid out sort of, if you will, an approach to information literacy that is somewhat common. Um, there's a few aspects in it that may not be. But at the same time, I think we need to acknowledge some of the tensions, and, and some of the groups already brought this up today. Um, but there's all kinds of things that sort of gnaw at me, right? Now, they don't stop me from going out into the world and trying to do good. But they do make me reflect and think about whether I'm doing the most good that I could be doing. So one of the questions for me is, is information literateness fixed? Like once you have it, you have it? And like it will never be lost again? Or is it developmental? Where you're kind of always trying to continue to improve? Okay. Is it absolute? Like, once you're information literate, you're information literate in every single context that you will ever encounter. Kind of related to the fixedness. Or is it contextual? Okay. Related to this is the breadth depth problem, right? Like, is there a, is it across a lot of things? Or is it mean when you go deep into something? In academia, we call that general versus disciplinary. We haven't talked a lot today about the affective side. One group mentioned it on their uh, post on their discussion. But we, we tend to talk a lot about the cognitive skills that relate to information literacy, <clears throat> but we don't necessarily talk a lot about the affective skills. And I want to be really clear when I say affective skills here, I don't mean do you like information literacy. What I mean is questions, the affective domain in Bloom's taxonomy of affective outcomes is about prioritization, motivation, and commitment. Okay? And then, of course, there is a psychomotor component to information literacy, as especially as we've talked about the tools that we have to use. And in fact, the typing story this morning at the pan, or sorry, not earlier this afternoon, was an excellent example of how psychomotor skills, you know, finding the keys on the keyboard, can be a barrier or facilitate our ability to exercise our information literacy. This relates to something that I really think a lot about, which is this whole issue of literacy and illiteracy, which was raised this morning by one of the, I keep saying this morning, this afternoon <laughs> by one of the questions that Julie asked. Um, but I'd like to add another concept in here that actually troubles me and, and I just, I wonder if this isn't actually some of what we're experiencing, which is a-literacy. And a-literacy in the literacy world is having the ability to read, but no interest and engagement with reading. And I sometimes <laughs> wonder when we look at our students' work, especially in academic settings, if it's not a literacy problem, but it's an a-literacy problem. And this comes back to the affective domain. Because I can look at the students that I'm teaching and see that they have their iTunes library organized, metadata, you know, <laughs> six ways to Sunday, <laughs> and yet those skills don't come into another environment. Okay? So that's the transfer problem, even within an individual at a moment in time, and that willingness and motivation to engage. And then the final thing that I think just sort of plagues our literature. Uh, professional literature especially, is the ends means confusion. That so much of our literature talks about information literacy, but the moment you start to read it, what they're actually talking about is an instructional program in a library which intends to help people develop information literacy. But it makes searching and understanding our literature very complex and unnecessarily confusing, I think, at times. So here are the tensions and the possible confusions that sort of I can see. Um, and I think while we need to act and we need to work to do well in the world, it can be a little bit of a challenge at the same time to remember that not everything is decided, and in fact, more may be undecided or unclear. And this is actually why it's professional work, okay? 
the students in the audience especially here. This is why it's professional work, because this is hard stuff to work through, okay? <clears throat> so let's think a little bit, though, about the societal context here as well. I mean, our collective lifespan, if you will. And there are a lot of documents, and it's already been mentioned this morning, IFLA, UNESCO, some of the work that's being done there, like the Prague Declaration, which was the original, towards an information literate society. So what does it mean for a society to be information literate? You just thought it was complex enough to figure out what it meant for an individual, <laughs> okay? Um, and IFLA continues to come back to this with UNESCO, the Alexandria Proclamation in 2006, which says that information literacy and lifelong learnings are the beacons of information society. Now UNESCO is working a lot on the world Information Society, they hold a summit called the World Summit on the Information Society, WSIS. So much good writing and work that's coming out of that context that we should really be aware of. Because one of the things, as much as we may struggle in our country, right, as, as a colleague of mine said in another country, you know, can you be information literate if you don't have intellectual freedom? We may find ourselves challenged by that in this country at times, but not like many of our <coughs> colleagues across the world do. Okay. So there's some precursors that we kind of have to ask ourselves. You know, if I'm not free to think, am I, can I actually be information literate? The most recent declaration is from 2012, earlier this year, uh, Moscow Declaration on Media and Information Literacy. And those of you who might be wondering, Prague, Alexandria, Moscow, it's where the meeting was held. <laughs> um, where within the UNESCO context, media and information literacy are being joined together in sort of a single stream of activity. Um, previously, there was a media literacy group and an information literacy group, and really trying to say to ourselves, well, can we work together conceptually to try and draw these threads together? Um, there's so many documents and details here. These quotes are far longer than they should be for a PowerPoint slide, but I want you to see that there's these rich documents that you can look at. So one of the things that this um, particular talk gave me an opportunity to do was to revisit an article that I wrote with four library school students in the summer of 2003, and this article appeared in Reference and User Services Quarterly. Okay. And this was a, it's titled, Examining the Context, New Voices Reflect on Information Literacy. And I'm still in touch with three of the four students who wrote this article, so I actually pinged all of them and said, hey, what do you think about this article a decade later? essentially, because even though it was published in 2003, we actually wrote it, of course, at least a year before. <laughs> um, I, I'm really privileged to be able to teach in the library school at Illinois, and at that point I was teaching the Information Literacy User Education course. I now teach the Academic Librarianship course. Um, but I had put out a challenge to my group of students one year and said, hey, you know, this Illinois Association of College and Research Libraries small conference is coming up. Who wants to be on a panel? You know, who wants to, like, let's step up, let's do something together. And four um, women, happened to be, all said, you know, I think I want to do that. And as we talked through what we might want to present about, we realized that we had an individual in each student interested in academic, school, public, and special libraries. So we looked at that context for each case, and each student sort of put out in the world something that they believed <coughs> about information literacy in that context. Um, I always feel bad that their names are not on this because it's, it's, it was really because of their work that anyone wanted to publish this, not mine. <laughs> um, but Christine Skoglin talked about public libraries as a place where young, young children can first encounter the concepts of information literacy and independent learning. Now hopefully they've also encountered this in their home but it is a place where they can do that. And hopefully it also gives them a positive experience with libraries. Jenny Wiedenbetter talked about the school library context as a place where students begin to understand in a curricular and formal way that information seeking is an activity that we might need to intentionally engage in. Um, Heather Tompkins 
put forward the idea that in academic libraries, students are having to use their independent seeking skills that they may have developed in their public library use with the structured things that they might have in school libraries in an environment that requires far more self-definition of what one is interested in and then moving that into an academic scholarly conversation. And finally, Amy Jansen, who I think had the hardest task at all, talking about special libraries, basically saying that what special libraries do is continuously introduce to people the idea that a library is not a library is not a library. And there's so much diversity that somebody might be encountering. Now, as I looked back over this, and, and Amy and Heather and, and Jenny did too, you know, we were, we felt pretty good about it. We felt that, you know, in retrospect, this was a pretty significant and honestly really early attempt to articulate a library ecology for information literacy. Because at that time, actually, first of all, there were no articles in the library literature that came up in any database if you did public library and information literacy. And there were none that came up on special library and information literacy. We broke new ground. <laughs> um, and I also liked that, you know, to bring these voices from the people who are coming into our profession, um, I think was very powerful. We also freed information by doing this from schooling settings. Because if you, if you think back, those of you who were around in 2003, information literacy was synonymous with direct instruction and with the schooling environment. So we at least offered up a vision that maybe there's something more than that. And finally, one of the things that is pulled through, and I, I do invite you to read the article and I'd love to hear what you think about it, what we pulled through that entire article was this idea that people's experiences in other library settings impact their expectations and how they work in a new setting. So people don't come to the academic library tabula rasa about libraries. They come with their public library, their school library, maybe even a special library kind of experience. And hopefully that's a good experience, but maybe it's not. <laughs> And this is true, we can say this across the entire library ecology. It's not special to academic libraries. <coughs> school libraries may have this. In fact, school libraries have the challenge as well that higher ed sends them teachers who may or may not be well educated about the role of school librarians. <laughs> um, just depending where those experiences happen first. So we're kind of proud of that, particularly this idea of the ecology. Um, which is the idea that there's a relationship between organisms or individuals and their environments, and that's impacting in both directions. Um, so this idea that information literacy belongs to the person, and that person brings that experience through our particular organizations. However, we had to admit upon a rereading, for obvious reasons, we had a fairly library-centric approach to thinking about information <laughs> literacy. Um, <laughs> so even though in each case we were positing a user, we were thinking about these four different settings and the users of those settings, and we didn't tell a story of an individual necessarily. We also have a very normative sort of conception in mind as you read that article. And the final thing that I've really come to realize um, and sort of have to take stock of my own professional practice here is the that an article very much assumes a user of privilege, a user who has a school library, a user who went to a public library, a user for whom information has been empowering and not intrusive. So there's a real sense, right, that we thought this is information's a good thing. But, you know, we really have to admit that the library is not the center of the world, maybe of our world, <laughs> but it is not the center of the world. And we really need to recenter our practice on the person and the community. And those of you who are familiar with David Lanky's participatory librarianship will know that he repeatedly reminds us that the mission of libraries is to improve society through facilitating knowledge creation in their communities. So information literacy is not for the sake of the library. It is for the sake of the user, the learner, the individual, the community. And I think it's really great that we tell the story of users in our libraries 
But one thing I'm realizing is that maybe we need to tell the story of the library in the life of the user. And really telling a story around a, a user, an individual, and what their experience is. Because one of the things our literature tends to do is also fragment our user experience studies in particular library types. So I can't actually personally think of any publication, though maybe somebody here knows one, that actually doesn't posit a library and the user, but rather looks at the user and says what are all of their information in library environments and what are the implications for practice. Okay? So we tend to think of our users as dependent on us. And then only recently did we say, oh, in competition with Google. Well, they were never just dependent on my library or your library or your library. They were always in this kind of ecological ecosystem kind of situation. So the normativeness. I've already spoken about this a little bit. But you know, is there really a right way to be information literate? Libraries aren't of one type, so can we really reduce our user experience to one type? Now, normative things can, however, help us function as a vision or a mission, but they might be an unattainable ideal. And there might be some disempowering notions of setting up unattainable ideals. Okay. And then, of course, the other question of, well, who's normative? Okay, my normative, your normative, right? People of power, people of dominant culture, who's normative? Okay, something we should really think about um, anytime that we see kind of should statements, you know, declaratives. Now, again, I think they have their use and their value, but we, we should be critically aware about this. Um, really think about how privileged some of our definitions and discussions are, and I kind of feel like group two stole a little thunder on this, but that's okay. <laughs> Information's ubiquitous, but is access. I mean, we talk about this a lot, but really, any of you who work in a library or are students, do a little experiment. Go and try and do your homework as a public library patron. Some of you may be already, but as an academic librarian, I would love to declare work as a patron in your library day, where I had to do my work with the tools we give our patrons, right? And just so many barriers that we put up for good reasons, maybe for not good reasons, but wow, when I'm sitting in my office with my completely network computer and my own printer, it's a pretty nice life, <laughs> okay? So, um, we also really believe that information is a positive and empowering aspect of life. But is it really, and for everyone? And a, a scholar I'd really encourage you to look at her work, if you have it, is Virginia Eubanks. She's in New York, um, and she's doing a lot, and she's a professor of social work. Um, one of her particular articles that I think is very powerful is called Trapped in the Digital Divide, the Distributive Paradigm in Community Informatics. She also has a book looking at this issue of information access, information literacy as, as social justice work. Okay. But she also told a story when she was on my campus recently about how invasive information and information technology is in the lives of people who, for example, depend <coughs> on um, just lost of welfare benefits, okay? So, you know, it used to be that there was no tracking of sort of exactly what you bought. And she told stories of people coming in to their caseworkers and having them have a list of everything that they had purchased because now it's all on these chips and it's all digital. And being grilled. Why did you buy this? Couldn't you have found a cheaper place? Okay, That is not an empowering information experience. That is not something that makes you say more information is better. Okay. The story, um, so anyways, I really recommend her work to you. I don't even know what I think about this yet, so much as, well, I do know this that I think about it. 
This is really, really important for librarians to think about. That's, that's what I do know for sure about this. Um, because particularly, I think back to when I worked in the community college, and I will tell you, I never felt like I made as much difference in the lives of people as when I worked in the community college. Like it's such a place of privilege at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, there, certainly we have students who, who struggle, who have financial struggles, but nothing like what I saw at the community college. Um, and just really thinking about what were these students' previous information experiences, or co-information experiences, right? Experiences they were having in other parts of their lives, right? Most people do not work at the computer at their desk in their office with complete freedom and privilege to be able to say, oh, I'm looking at Facebook to catch up on NPR, to use the, the earlier example today. Most people work with filters and with tracking software. Okay? It's not a positive information environment for people. And then, you know, here's another interesting question, like, really to dig into. Do people have a right to say, I don't want to be information literate? But if you know enough about what information literacy is, would you actually, ironically, be information literate? <laughs> okay. But leaving aside that little conundrum, I mean, should people have a right to say, I don't want that? <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about this schooling environment. It is really the ultimate privilege to define what should be for other people, okay? which really is an awesome responsibility of educators. Okay? And that responsibility is there in direct instruction. And here's a, a bullet I had to add after earlier today. This whole issue of modeling. Okay? So it's one thing when we think about the responsibility of educators to put together curriculum to teach lessons. But some of the biggest lessons they are giving is through their modeling and their own behaviors. Okay? And we can look back at ourselves as librarians and wonder, you know, has our library documented all of our resources and sources and where we've gotten things? Did we cite our sources when we adapted that policy from somewhere else? Okay? Something for us to think about in this particular environment is this question of modeling. Um, the real schooling that happens may be much more through observation, but regardless, if this interests you, and it's not a K-12 study, but project information literacy, some of you may have heard about it, gathered up research assignments from faculty at institutions around the country, and I want to be clear that this particular study's methodology um, did not have the librarian saying, oh, ask this faculty member for their assignment, okay? I actually <coughs> participated in the, the process, and what I was asked to do was to ask somebody on my campus to identify good teachers, and then the researchers contacted those teachers and asked if they would please submit a research assignment example. So these are things that people probably were proud of, right, if they submitted them to a national study. Yeah, not looking so good for the quality of guidance and research support that faculty are giving to students about doing research. Far more instruction around how many pages it should be, it should be double spaced, it should be in this font, it should have this margins. And at best, in most cases, it would be like, you might want to look at EBSCO or the library will have some resources. Not nearly the level of detailed instruction. So even in direct instruction, the one study we have, not going so well. <clears throat> so, and the system definitely has inherent inequalities. I mean, when you're the teacher, you get to decide. You get to grade. Uh, now, increasingly, teachers are also finding themselves in a point of inherent inequality where what they're allowed to grade and what they're required to teach may not exactly be within their control in the same way it used to be. So they might be experiencing that same sense of inequality. You know, what can we do about this? I mean, it's very popular, of course, to talk about this whole resisting the banking concept that somehow or another, the teacher knows, they'll pour it into the students, the students will put it in a deposit account and take it out the door with them. And um, pursuing the co-creation of knowledge, where we come to know things together. 
Um, and, and that's, I think, a very laudable ideal again. But increasingly, I think teachers and educators are finding themselves challenged by testing systems, funding models, um, all sorts of things that are impacting on this particular approach. Not that you can't still take this approach, but there's a lot of things pushing against you. Okay. And then the other question we just have to keep asking ourselves is, well, how applicable are all of these things that we develop in schooling to non-schooling environments? I mean, it's one thing when people sort of enter, if you will, a social contract. When they take my class on academic librarianship, I'm going to teach them academic librarianship. We sort of have an agreement around that. Well, I'm not sure that that agreement quite obtains when somebody goes into their business, their, their, their special library in their place of business, like that this is going to be an educational moment, right? Or in the public library setting, right? So it's, it's a little tricky to think about how these might actually apply, um, you know, in this environment. So for me, what I'm always trying to do with my students and the learning outcomes is to try and adopt, and it was used this earlier today, critical information literacy. Not only evaluate the information content and context, but to help students, learners become aware, and actually I include faculty here, the systems and structures from which information emerges. I mean, it doesn't just like poof, right? It always comes out of some individual or community. And it includes helping students become aware of what does not emerge due to decisions and factors that may or may not be obvious. And in fact, I still see in my mind this young man from about eight years ago, English class, small writing class, we're going over scholarly, popular, peer review, all that good stuff. And all of a sudden he's like, wait, that means some ideas might never get published. <laughs> My work is done. <laughs> but it was this incredible moment for him of realizing that the world actually is making decisions about what he had access to and what was going to be privileged in his coursework. And it wasn't always going to necessarily be the best ideas, but rather the best ideas that could make their way through the peer review process. He said, but what if somebody has a controversial idea? How will they ever get people to say it's OK? You are so smart. Are you going to ground school? <laughs> right? So uh, I wish I could say I've had thousands of those conversations. <laughs> but I mean, I'll tell you one of the things that's so interesting to me is we talk about searching Google as if we're all searching the same thing. Unless you don't have, well, actually you're not, even if you don't have an account. Not a single one of us has the same Google search experience anymore. Early on we did, right? We could call up the same result sets. Now you can't. Not only can't you based on your own personal history of searching Google, but you can't based on where you are physically in the world. I was sitting at a computer in a hotel in Ghana, and it would not give me US websites that I knew existed. I mean, I knew. I had the keywords. I could not get them. OK? So are we critically aware? OK? So I'll tell you, I could care less if students know how to find the call number of a book or use the OPAC. Because the student who's motivated to find information and really wants to find what they believe can help make their argument, they will come to the reference desk and say, hey, I can't figure out how to get this book. No student, even if they know how to use the OPAC, is going to come to the reference desk and say, you know, I just feel I'm not critically aware enough about the way you can the structure in the world. Could you just like give me five minutes on that? No, it's not going to happen. So for me, it, you're kind of starting to see a thing here. Information literacy across the lifespan is far more about the affective domain than it is about the cognitive. So I'm kind of calling us to task. Our curriculum is way focused on the cognitive domain. So I'm going to add in one concept, and we'll see if Julie thinks this helps answer her question this morning, um, of information culture. This idea that maybe what being successful with information means is not so much that normative, always true for all time, 
But what it means is being able to engage with an information culture in an organization or setting where one can, is judged to be information literate based on being able to engage productively with information in that context for the purposes that one uses information in that context. Um, to really look at then what counts as quality information in this environment? What counts as citing my sources? Because I kind of quibble with Julie. I think they do sort of sort cite their sources in Huffington Post. They cite them the way journalists cite their sources. They don't cite them the way academics cite their sources. Okay. Um, so thinking about that, now I'm not saying every Huffington Post article does it great, right? Mm -hmm. But um, we might think about that. And this, to me, is a way of bringing in the context. But in the way of bringing in the context that doesn't just throw aside all markers of quality and just become relativistic of, well, it's just your opinion or it's just, no. Actually, for me, information literacy is ultimately defined by the community that you're a part of. And one of the things that I will hearken back to the 1980s there is a document that ACRL put out in the 1980s called the Model Statement of Objectives for Academic Bibliographic Instruction. You can see why that title never caught on. <laughs> <laughs> what was brilliant about that document is what it said we need to do in academia is teach students that information comes from communities, is privileged by communities, is judged by communities, and needs to be used in community. And what the ultimate facility with information is, is the ability to move between and among the communities of which you are a part and to adjust your behavior and approaches in context of those communities, while at the same time remaining aware of the criticalness, the critical stance, that when you will want to take action to change the information culture of a particular community to say this is not the way we should treat a particular body of work or a particular group of authors. It's a very, very complex thing. So for me, um, I wrote an essay called Information Literacy as a Way of Life. And this is the way I summed it up for me in this of what I want for students. And I'm in the academic context. For them to be, become habitual askers of questions, seekers of new knowledge, critical thinkers, and informed decision makers. But let me leave you with a final question. If you are, how would you know? And if you aren't, why do you think you're not? Thank you. conscientious objection I saw at least some like non-verbal like whoa I'd like to ask a question or something here so <laughs> maybe not <laughs> no. No, maybe they just need to talk. oh Clara <laughs> I could have I guess I should have ignored it I could have gotten out of it though no, <laughs> you brought up the whole notion of information culture so mm -hmm. how is that uh, being introduced into a new way for us to teach information literacy <clears throat> So, um, interesting that you say that. <laughs> um, I've been talking a lot with one of our business librarians about this particular context because she's very interested in not academic information literacy, but sort of work preparation information literacy. And there's an interesting sort of leave it for what it is, but you know, by and large, graduates from the University of Illinois Library, or University of Illinois Business School, are going to end up in managerial and leadership positions. It's just kind of the way the world of privilege sends them. Um, and so, 
she's saying, you know, but yet every survey of employers says that students can't deal with information in the workplace. They can't communicate, they don't understand it, they waste time looking for it. So what she's trying to figure out is, well, what is workplace information culture? Because there's very little documented on this, actually. About, I mean, so there's like a theoretical body of literature out there of information culture, but very little empirical study saying, okay, well then, are, is there a typology of information cultures? Is there a taxonomy? Is there... Um, so one of the things that she is doing is having students um, talk to people who work and ask them questions about how they use information. Um, and then trying to say, okay, well, if that's how they use information, how do you use information? And helping students monitor the gaps for themselves because one of the things is, is they're gonna get into the workplace and then maybe they'll change jobs or the culture will shift. And if they don't actually have the facility to actually change as a new culture, then they're gonna be back in with employers saying, you sent us people who can't do what we need them to do. So I don't know that that's a, a, an explicit <coughs> curriculum answer, but sort of I can at least share what we're sort of trying to struggle with with that particular setting. But it does raise this other problem for us, which is we know those students go into this kind of job, and that kind of job is fairly homogeneous, it might be a little bit more challenging for us when we go to say the sociology department and think about what we should be doing there because the student career path is not nearly so obvious. I always make more problems, not fewer. <laughs> Can I yeah. do another one? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> for, me, right. for me, it's important that information empowers change and is there a way to introduce that into teaching information literacy? We can see, you know, the world critically now. We can see the inequities. So can we teach that other part not to just engage information into disseminating it, but how do we engage information that we now ensure that there is new information or we make something visible or we call the truth out on something or we just go and uh, change something in society, right? So, I mean, again, we'll probably hearken back to earlier comments today that, you know, 50 minutes is not enough to do anything. <laughs> Collective sets of 50 minutes are enough to do something, but um, especially for librarians, it's a challenge because often um, we're not working within a curriculum that we know the structure of. So what I would take it back to as far as professional practice for us is really the importance of knowing the way the curriculum is structured and how students, it's gonna come back to users here, how students experience the curriculum. And one of the things we've done at Illinois is run little workshops where our librarians come with the course catalog and I have like a whole color-coded scheme for post-it notes and we actually make a map of what it takes to major in this area that they, they work with. And librarians are many times, and I've done this at other institutions, they see the curriculum in a whole new way. Because historically what they've done is they've looked at the course catalog where everything's in numeric order, okay? And then they look at how students actually take the curriculum, and it turns out that they do not do it in numeric order at all, okay? So if we're gonna have students work towards this sort of critical level of awareness and then, hey, what would you like to do about that? We're gonna have to really understand how they're experiencing their education, not just the library. Um, what I will say is I think those of us who work in academia work with a population who are actually quite interested in making a difference in the world. Um, if you look at the surveys of college seniors and college freshmen, um, while they do wanna get a job and they do go to college with the idea of making more money, they have not completely abandoned the idea that they would also like to make a difference in the world. They just don't want those two things juxtaposed against each other. <laughs> um, but So we should also think about the moment that, at least for me, the students are where they really do want to make that difference. <coughs> so I will be happy to stay and talk with people individually, but I think our organizers have a few additional uh, housekeeping details, yes. but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. That was that was very thought provoking. And you asked a lot of questions that I don't have good answers to. So um, maybe as you know, time goes on, we'll come up with some answers that prove helpful for all of us. Um, so uh, just a few things before we go. Um, thank you for for sticking with us through this day. 
Um, but we want to give prizes to our poster sessions. We have uh, three prizes, a first, second, and third. And uh, we had three really wonderful judges today. Uh, Beth Martin, I, yeah, yes, Beth Martin, Beth Fowler Williams, and Fatih uh were our judges. So, and uh, they, they, took a, they took a lot of time and effort to uh, come up with their final results. So our uh, third place winner today is uh, you don't have to check your full self at the door to check out a book. The Relationships Between Librarians and Fostering an Information Literate Society. So uh, that whole group, stand up. <laughs> Devin Stokes, Franklin Robbins, <laughs> and So if at least one of you would come down here and collect your, um, collect your prize, yes. Thank you, that was great. The poster sessions were all extraordinary. Thanks, y'all. I'll, I'll come this way. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Our yeah. uh, second prize winner today is Pen Formation, which I thought was just an awesome title. Literacy, Pen, Pinterest for Information Literacy, Emily Mann and Leanne Elias. Very good, thank you. Congratulations. And first place is Usability Testing on the Right Path, uh, D. Munch. Yes. I want to, yes, a oh, lot, well, not done. I got a list. Uh, so thank, thank you very much for participating in the poster sessions. We had really great participation this year. I think it's the best we've had in the, you know, in three or four years. So uh, thank you. Um, there's an evaluation form in your folder. If you would take a moment to fill that out, uh, that will help us for planning for next year. And give us an idea of just the uh, positives and maybe the things we need to change uh, from this conference. And we'll take those up, out, up at the door. If you don't have a chance to fill them out today, there's an email address and also a mailing address where you can send them. Uh, last but not least, I want to uh, thank several people. I want to thank our graduate assistants. If you guys would stand up, there's a whole crew of them. <laughs> They did an extraordinary job of helping us to uh, plan and actually getting everything set up for this conference. Uh, I want to thank Nora Bird. And she and I, yes, she and I spent a, uh, a great deal of time. And thanks to Sandra. Yes, thank you. We spent a, a great deal of time um, over the course of the last six months uh, trying to make this valuable for you guys. And, nor uh, work very hard on that. And then last but not least, I, I want to thank our facilitators from the breakout session and our keynote speaker and our panelists for uh, really contributing uh, so much to this conference to make it successful. So thank you for attending. We hope to see you next year and have a really great evening. And have another piece of cake if it's yes, still out there. <laughs> A picture? Oh, yeah.